So welcome everybody to RSS. Um, it's my real privilege to be the moderator for our last Early Career Award. Um, so this is going to be a talk by Professor Jeanette Bogue. Uh, and I know this format, this whole Zoom thing is, is weird to us all, but uh, I really encourage you to use the chat and the Q&A, especially at the end. Uh, to answer question, to ask your your questions, uh, we all have to try a little harder to be to be present and to be with each other um, when we have these sort of technological. It's it's not exactly technological barriers; it's technological ways to mediate the way that we're that we're together. So please, you know, try a little extra harder to you know put yourself out there. We want you to ask questions and stuff. Um, so it's my real honor to introduce Jeanette. She's uh, professor at Stanford University. Um, before that, she was a PhD student at KTH in Stockholm. Uh, and she, um, in her research, she, she studies uh, perception and learning for autonomous robotic manipulation and grasping. Um, she's doing really cool work. Um, she's won a number of awards. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hear her talk. Jeanette. Thank you, Stephanie, for the kind introduction. So hi, everyone, and welcome to my talk. I'm, I'm honored to receive this year's RSS Early Career Award, along with some of my favorite roboticists, Byron Boots and Luca Calone. Um, so today, I want to take this opportunity to talk about some principles that I came to believe will get us closer to autonomous robots. And specifically, I want to emphasize how failures and limitations of my own methods have informed my views on what these principles actually may be. All right, so my research is on manipulation and grasping, as Stephanie said, and it is driven by the puzzle of why humans can effortlessly manipulate any kind of object, um, while um, it is so hard to reproduce the skill on a robot that has a completely different uh, embodiment. And um, somehow struggling with the controls. Okay. In my first work, I tried to address this challenge by looking into finding suitable grasping points uh, for any kind of object. And uh, we assume that these objects are presented to the robot as uh, 2D images. And we formalized the problem of grasp point detection as a classification problem as put forward by Sixina et al. in 2006. So um, you imagine you have this robot who wants to pick up this cup and uh, it sees this cup through a camera. So what we do is we compute a per pixel feature and then um, compute the probability that this pixel represents uh, a good grasping point. How do we train this? Uh, what we are using is actually a classifier. How do we train this? We use the same database that was put forward by Saxena et al and uh, use supervised learning uh, to train uh, a support vector machine in SVM. Okay, so this was basically the methodology that was put forward uh, by Saxena et al in 2006. And uh, the contribution I made in my work was in particular on the feature representation of the data for grasping. And I propose to use something called shape context that captures the shape of the entire object relative to a pixel in the image. So here's how uh, this looked like. And remember, this is pre-deep learning, pre-connect, pre-big data and all of this, right? So feature engineering. Uh, so basically the robot got um, um, an image of this pen and then I extracted uh, all the, the edge features. And for the shape context, I computed all the uh, vectors pointing from one pixel to all the other uh, pixels on that pen. And uh, I collected all these vectors into, so their magnitude and their orientation into a histogram, which is called the shape context of this particular uh, one point. And this was really the feature. And then when using the feature, here's what the output would look like when classifying each pixel um, with uh, graspability. And you see that it actually nicely captures that uh, this pen should be grasped uh, in the center, at the center of mass. Okay, so far so good. Um, we showed actually that this outperforms the previous formulation by a pretty large margin. So for now, we have an idea uh, what pixel in the RGB image represents a good uh, grasping point. Uh, but of course, grasping is really a spatial uh, process and we need to infer a 6D pose uh, of the hand 
uh, linked to that grasping point. And the details here are not very important. We basically use some local 3D information around the 2D grasping point to infer this. Um, so let me show you two successes of this. Um, remember, this is a uh, pretty vintage video. It's from 2009. Uh, but this is how this method basically performed when actually executed on a real robot. So here, this uh, industrial arm with this pretty huge hand grasping this uh, box and is actually succeeding at it. And uh, also here's another example, a second one, uh, where it will also be successful. And I want to just have you pay attention actually to this shadow here. And yeah, that is me being full of joy that this actually worked. So um, uh, from this uh, joyful expression uh, for the success, you can infer that this method did actually not work that often very well. So here are two failures for you of how this actually looked like um, when it didn't work so well. The first one is more of an uh, accidental grasp um, where basically the, the robot is just barely succeeding at this. Um, and this is due to noise and uh, um, all these effects that come in on the real world. And here's a second one, a second failure case where the robot tries to grasp this cup. And uh, it really, um, it really could need some tactile feedback here because it's basically slipping, right? Okay, so um, basically um, I'm gonna go towards uh, asking what the insights were that I get from this project. So first of all, the work by Saxena has certainly kickstarted an entire field of learning to grasp. And um, it was really good in that it departed from prior work that made many assumptions about what is known uh, about the object. Uh, it also did not infer precise contact points, uh, but actually only hand poses, while contact points at this point were much more uh, common. And uh, today we basically find many interesting works, like for example, the Google Arm Farm or DexNet, that basically follow this overall methodology, but have of course much better data, better learning approaches and so on. And if you want to know more, you should check out these surveys. Um, but here are, um, some of the, the problems with this method. So the contributions that I made, I made, uh, I made contributions to this field, but um, with this first approach, um, I found that it was extremely brittle and actually failed often. And here's what I learned. Basically, open loop does not work, right? You cannot just like assume that the grasp you inferred was actually gonna work. You have to take feedback into account. And then, um, this approach also completely ignored the environmental contact and requires careful post-processing for collision uh, checking and so on. And the 2D grasping points, finally, they don't carry enough information. There have to be a lot of heuristics into, in place to actually infer the 60 grasp posts. All right. So um, for me personally, the real value of my first PhD project was not in the scientific uh, contribution. The real value was in the lessons I have learned uh, uh, on what works and especially what does not work uh, in robotic grasping. So um, first of all, I recognize the importance of continuous multimodal feedback and constant replanning. Um, so this may be obvious to many of you right now, but it wasn't obvious for me back in 2009. And uh, what is not obvious is how to actually implement this. Um, then instead of avoiding collision with everything else but the target object, you should actually exploit contact with the environment. And um, apart from feature representations, action representation matter a lot for the success of a robot. Okay, so let's start with this uh, first point. Um, so again, like it's probably clear to many of you, um, that uh, closing perception action loops around high dimensional sensory data is necessary, but how to concretely do that on a high dimensional system is an open question, right? So during my time at the autonomous motion department, I started focusing exactly on this problem. And here's an example for some uh, behavior that the resulting system produces, which uh, literally the uh, half of the department has worked on. So Apollo, the robot has to grasp the Springles box here uh, without knocking anything over. And Jim Mainprice here in the background makes it really hard for Apollo by moving around the objects in the environment. So Apollo really has to keep track of the environment in real time and provide the feedback to a fast motion generation mechanism that drives the behavior. And actually both of these things allow it to react to all these dynamics. 
So here's a simplified figure of this architecture that is operating under the hood of the system. Um, so I have no time to explain each box, uh, but, e but each of them makes a contribution to real-time tracking uh, and online trajectory uh, generation. But what I want you to pay attention to is how these real-time perception methods and reactive motion generation methods are actually connected. In our system, everything is connected in perception action loops uh, of different frequencies. So updates to the world model and motion policies are really done asynchronously whenever information is available. And notice that this is not a hierarchy. Um, and uh, con the, the architecture is actually important because no matter how amazing your components are, if you put them together in the wrong way, you lose out. Um, and in this paper here at the bottom, we showed this empirically. But let me first uh, walk you through one loop in the system. Um, so we start out with raw sensory data and we have RGB and depth here coming in at uh, 30 Hertz and proprioceptive data from a robot at a kilohertz. And using real-time visual tracking methods, uh, this data is processed um, to infer the object pose, the robot arm pose, and also obstacles in the environment. So given this uh, information, we compute potential fields where the target object provides an attractive potential and the obstacles repulsive potentials, as shown here with the red arrows. And this feedback is used by local controllers uh, that compute the optimal next best action that bring the arm closer to the goal and push it away from the obstacles. Um, we also use um, an online trajectory optimizer that optimizes action over a time horizon of two seconds. And it produces acceleration policies here shown in green. And these are called Riemannian motion policies. And these are tracked by an inverse dynamics controller. So this online trajectory optimizer is much slower than the feedback controllers, runs at five to 10 Hertz. And therefore it cannot react as quickly to changes, uh, but it is less susceptible to local minima. So we, we fuse these two types of policies to obtain a fuse policy that is updated at a kilohertz. And um, remember, this update happens asynchronously whenever new information is available. All right. So we actually compared uh, three architectures empirically. The first one is the sense plan act architecture, which is um, basically the standard one that many people are still using where the robot senses once in the beginning, then plans and then acts. And then uh, we also compare to a locally reactive controller that doesn't do any look ahead, but closes a very fast perception action loop that runs at a kilohertz. And then um, this is our uh, proposed architecture, which uh, basically cl closes multiple perception action loop at different frequencies and also has some look ahead. So we evaluated these uh, different system architectures with the same components in these four different scenarios of which three are dynamic. And uh, I cannot show you all of these results, um, but I show you uh, one example. So um, this is how the scenario looks like. So we have um, uh, Apollo again, this robot, uh, it has to pick up the Springles box and then has to bring it to the other side of the table. And uh, Francisca Maya here in the picture, she's going to um, actually uh, push an obstacle into the way that uh, Apollo again has to avoid. So we uh, have to react uh, online. And um, so let me show you how this looks like for a sense plan act. So basically the robot uh, sensed one the, uh, once the environment planned its trajectory and then uh, is jo just going to act no matter what, right? Because it doesn't use feedback and of course it uh, bumps against this obstacle. If we use um, uh, a locally reactive controller, uh, Apollo is also pretty successful, but it gets stuck uh, at, in this local minima and cannot find a way out, uh, but at least it doesn't collide and it can recover once the obstacle is removed. And uh, our architecture that actually includes some look ahead can recover from this, um, um, from this obstacle and actually find this narrow passage. Um, to bring the, the obstacle to the other side. All right, so just to uh, summarize this work that, as I said, like literally half the autonomous motion department actually worked on. 
uh, the main idea here was um, to propose a system architecture that consists of interlocked perception action loops that run at uh, different uh, frequencies um, and uh, where things are updated asynchronously. And the contribution of this paper was really quantifying uh, what the, uh, how this is basically benefiting the entire system. So, um, and the result was a successful manipulation platform in uncertain and dynamic environments. All right, so um, uh, I talked to you a little bit about um, uh, uh, the importance of continuous feedback and the possibility to replan. And um, uh, I, I want to come to the next lesson that I learned, um, which is that the major obstacle to ro robust grasping um, in my previous work was certainly the complete neglect um, uh, in the grasping point detection algorithm of the environmental context. And uh, basically after a promising grass post was computed, there had to be a lot of post-processing with collision checking and so on. And, um, and that uh, was actually necessary to protect the robot and its surrounding. But as it turns out, um, actually humans uh, <clears throat> are not avoiding the environment when manipulating objects. Uh, so here's an example from Julia Child that maybe many of you know, chopping potatoes, and it was introduced to the community by Matt Mason, so thank you, Matt. And um, so you see here, for example, that she's using the knuckles of her fingers to actually, uh, um, as a constraint, to actually guide the knife. And here's another example of a clever design to help manipulation, which you find at everyday ATMs. There's actually a funnel around the card slot that helps the, um, the person who wants to insert the card to actually uh, insert it, right, uh, more easily. And um, we know that uh, for, ro for robots, um, autonomously learning um, robot skills is really challenging. So there are contact-rich tasks. Uh, these, these here, for example, are contact-rich tasks, um, can I go back, <laughs> that actually require a lot of uh, precision and they are very hard to do. So if um, a robot could actually insert a fixture, this task suddenly becomes uh, easy because uh, the fixture blocks uh, wrong motion and uh, basically provides a funnel that restricts um, the motion of the robot and guides the robots towards uh, the goal of this manipulation task. Um, right, so this uh, idea of um, um, the robot actually exploiting contact constraints um, was also uh, shown to work really well uh, by other groups. So here, for example, I have some examples from Alberto Rodriguez group with the motion cones or um, some work, uh, some example work from the um, community of soft Apologies for, for my voice and all of this. So uh, these soft robots, for example, make it very easy to actually get in touch without destroying the environment or the robot itself. This is nice. And then also here on the, on the bottom right, uh, we have examples from the DARPA arm challenge where uh, the grasping is done uh, by also getting in touch with the environment. Okay, so but um, the majority of these works though, they design how the environment looks like and how it can be exploited and therefore determine the behaviors. And we were really wondering if the robot can discover uh, itself how it can place uh, this fixture um, and therefore guide uh, or scaffold manipulation plan. So our approach uh, consists of uh, an inner and an outer loop that each run uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, the outer loop learns to place a physical fixture. You see here on the bottom right, this uh, one arm placing this red fixture. And then the inner loop uh, learns a manipulation skill given this uh, particular fixture pose. So after a fixed number of iteration, this inner loop uh, returns the achieved reward to the outer loop. And the higher the reward uh, achieved by the inner loop, the more reward the fixture pose um, outer loop basically receives in the outer loop. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at the outer loop. We formulate this problem of selecting this pose as a contextual bandit problem, uh, where basically uh, the goal is to learn a good policy for placing this fixture. And the context is a depth image that you see here on the, on the right. And uh, in this outer loop, the goal is to learn a function QW, 
um, that approximates the, the true Q function, which outputs the expected reward after taking action A, so placing this fixture. And the context is the depth image uh, as in this process by CML. So once we have learned this QW function at test time, we basically use QT opt um, and basically run uh, the cross entropy method to find an uh, optimal action. So that's all, all good. The real channel challenge is in learning the QW function because the true Q function is discontinuous. So let me explain how this looks like with this uh, graph, where on the X axis we have the fixture pose, so the action, and on the Y axis we have the expected reward. So for training, uh, um, so sorry, yeah, so here is, um, on the x-axis, uh, these different fixture poses. On, on the very right, you see a pose where the hole is actually covered. So a peg can actually not be inserted, so the expected return would be zero. And uh, the further you move uh, the fixture um, towards the right, you see at some point, basically, uh, the robot can suddenly insert the peg um, and achieves maximum reward. And then uh, if you move the fixture further away, you get like a less uh, optimal fixture pose with lower reward. Um, so this is the discontinuity in this reward function, and it's very hard to learn. And we proposed a smooth zooming algorithms that you can look up in the paper. I unfortunately don't have time today to talk more in detail about it. Uh, but yeah, that algorithm can basically learn this function. Um, so in the inner loop, it's, to be honest, not very interesting. It basically uses an off-the-shelf model-free uh, method. We use A3C in this case, and given this fixture pose, it basically learns um, uh, to do the manipulation task. So what we found is then that learning uh, with an optimal fixture pose in the inner loop is actually significantly faster. So here you have an example again for the peg insertion task. Um, where when the fixture is post, um, placed uh, optimally in orange, then the learning curve is much uh, steeper, so it's much earlier successful. While with a suboptimal no fixture, you basically have a very low reward. And for the other tasks we looked at, um, this is kind of the same picture. So um, the approach, um, um, now putting it basically all together, uh, here we have the outer loop uh, wrapped around uh, the inner loop. And uh, basically one thing to remember is the faster the inner loop uh, robot learns, the higher is the reward for the outer loop robot. And uh, here's just an example for uh, how this learned QW actually looks like. Um, on, the, on the bottom here, you see two fixture poses in the same orientation, but slightly shifted. <clears throat> and they correspond to this Q map uh, where uh, basically we want good poses to have a darker value X corresponding to a higher reward and less good poses to have a lower value. And this is exactly what you, what you see here because this uh, leftmost fixture posture basically constrains these two corners of the hole. And we have the same picture basically for other orientation of this fixture. All right, so here's uh, an example of how this looks like on a real robot. Um, first, it basically samples this fixture pose using uh, the cross entropy method. And after it converged, uh, we basically run uh, the inner loop policy that now is an easier time to actually insert uh, this pole. And here we have the other task. This is the wrench manipulation task where we also sample these different poses. <clears throat> And um, uh, you see here, this block is basically supporting um, the Z direction, which is hard to control. And uh, this is the shallow depth insertion task, which you need when you, for example, insert a battery into a, a, a phone. And um, also here, um, you see the same uh, benefits from actually having this fixture. So here's another cool thing about this work. Uh, we actually trained all of this in simulation. And then we uh, directly run uh, the resulting policy in the real world. And, um, and also it doesn't only transfer well from sim to real, uh, it also transfers well to different variations of the task. So here you see different shapes of the peg and you can basically use the same fixture pose uh, selection algorithm and the same policy to do this insertion. So this is uh, really nice. And uh, so just to summarize this work, uh, the main idea here is to uh, let the robot learn to alter the environment to scaffold uh, manipulation skills. 
And uh, we achieved this with some algorithmic con contributions, for example, the smooth zooming algorithms for learning a discontinuous Q function. And um, what we arrive at is more robust manipulation and learning, um, uh, and, and learning that is actually sped up dramatically. All right, so uh, coming to the next lecture I learned uh, from my work. Um, so basically something I was really convinced about after my first PhD project was that it, uh, that it makes total sense to infer an entire grass pose from, IG, uh, from RGB and depth images. So I thought this was a great idea and inferring contact points uh, for the fingers is a thing of the past. And uh, actually my student Lynn convinced me otherwise. He suggested uh, that contact points are actually much better abstraction for a robot uh, for a grasp as they allow for a greater variety of uh, hand pre-shapes, uh, approach angles, and a variety of hands. So let me, let me uh, give you some insights or some reasoning here. So uh, one thing to note is actually that a good grasp depends on both the object and uh, the gripper. And uh, we propose a model that, um, that can grasp any object with uh, any gripper. And uh, to achieve this, Unigrass uh, basically, uh, this, as this model is called, selects a set of contact points uh, and then uh, results um, uh, that are basically adaptive to the shape of the object, but also to the robot hand, as you see here. And so how does this work? So as input, uh, this model takes an object point cloud and the specification of the kinematics and geometry of the robot hand. And then uh, this model sequentially outputs contact points and these contact points are both reachable by the hand and in force closure. So uh, we basically uh, compute, um, um, so basically this model Unigrasp extracts gripper geometry and kinematic features and then concatenates them with object features uh, in the encoding stage. And uh, let me briefly explain. So basically we just um, use a URDF file of the hand which contains this description and then we use an autoencoder um, to uh, basically learn an embedding space for robotic hands in a specific configuration. And uh, we basically use this encoder then to, um, to compute an entire feature in different configurations. Okay, so how does this embedding space look like? Here's a, an example. Um, so uh, we basically uh, first computed uh, to visualize this embedding space um, <clears throat> two um, features for two input point clouds here shown on the left and right. And we interpolate between two features to decode the interpolated uh, um, um, features into some point cloud. And in the top row, you can see that it's basically a prismatic movement of the fingers. In the middle, you can see a revolute motion that is correctly interpolated. And here you can see even um, geometric uh, interpolation between different hands. All right, so this is the gripper feature we are using. For the object feature, we basically use uh, point cloud and compute point, uh, a feature using point uh, net plus plus. Um, all right, so here is actually the, the real contribution of this work, which is this computation of the contact points. And uh, this is really a difficult combinatorial problem and we propose an entire new architecture to do this. Um, and I can't explain this uh, in detail, so I'm just gonna walk you through it uh, really briefly. Um, so let's say we have an N-fingered gripper, then this model has N stages. And in stage one, it basically estimates the probability for each point in the object point cloud um, if this point belongs to a valid set of contact points. And then it ranks these points. And in stage one, it basically um, conditions on uh, one of these uh, points and then uh, computes or predicts the probability of uh, each point in this point cloud again to form a valid set of contact points together with this first point. And then again, we rank this and we go to stage three where we finally arrive at um, enough contact points for each of the fingers. So we, we actually show uh, that this uh, geometry of the hand actually matters. So here's just a toy example where we look at the same object but vary the gripper. And uh, this particular gripper that you see here in blue um, has a very small opening and the object is shown here with these black uh, points and the contact points uh, are shown in red and yellow. And you see because it cannot open very widely it has to grasp uh, at the thin part and um, 
Then uh, we see here for another hand, it can actually not close all the way, but open much more widely. The model selects um, contact points that are at the thick point. And similar good points are selected for three-fingered hand. Okay, so uh, we wanted to grasp novel objects with various grippers. So here are some experimental results and uh, nice videos. We evaluated for all of these hands. And here's some examples um, of what we do, um, uh, of how this looks like for a hand that we have actually trained the model on and how the contact points actually looks like. And we achieve a pretty high success rate. But uh, personally, I find this experiment more interesting where we use novel hands that the model hasn't seen before. So we're testing with these three hands. Um, and we are, so we are grasping novel objects with a novel gripper. And uh, here, um, the model basically has to predict two contact points for two fingers of the Kinova uh, hand. <clears throat> this is an example with the more complex uh, Allegro hand uh, grasping with three fingers. Um, which also looks very interesting. And keep in mind, these are all precision grasps. Um, there are also some failures here, as you can see. Um, and uh, failure cases are typically due to imprecise perception, low friction of the object, deformations, or premature contact. And uh, I think these can be maybe solved with um, these uh, continuous feedback in the future. All right, so just to summarize this last work that I'm gonna present, um, we, we basically, our main idea was, can we learn a model that given an object and a hand description can actually compute contact points? And the uh, algorithmic contribution that we made here was this point set selection network that has to solve this very difficult combinatorial problem. And uh, the outcome is a model that outputs valid graphs also for novel hands. Okay, so with this, I will conclude my talk. Uh, I showed you some results for my first project, for my first ever project I've done during my PhD. And I gave you three lessons I personally took away from observing the limitations of this first work. And I showed you three works uh, that addressed these challenges. The first one was basically an entire system that uh, is really capable of continuous, um, of computing compu continuous feedback and wrapping a replanner around it. I showed you uh, a work in which a robot can actually learn to alter the environment uh, to the scaffold manipulation. And finally, I showed you some work uh, uh, that is an example for uh, something that I had to, uh, where I had to unlearn a lesson I, I thought I had learned. So, um, so this was a model that uh, basically in first contact points instead of full grasp poses, and therefore it allowed uh, grasping even with novel hands. Okay, so what's next? Lots of things. Uh, I think um, we are working a lot on not only taking visual feedback into account, but also touch information. Uh, here at RSS, we also have a paper that actually uses language uh, to index manipulation con uh, concepts. Um, so I find this very interesting. And in general, I'm much more interested in uh, and now in more complex manipulation tasks. So for example, sequential tasks where we've done some work on tasks in motion planning. Uh, I'm also interested in, uh, in manipulating more complex objects, like for example, deformable objects uh, in this work. And finally, I'm excited about working on more than one robot as well. Also with some example work here. And um, right, so just to make like one last point before I close this talk, I want to make one meta point on, on how to approach failure and limitations and research. Um, so seeing my old videos now, especially with that joyful shadow in one of them, is pretty funny. Uh, but it can tell you that it was way more frustrating back then at two o'clock in the morning when things are failing. Uh, so only when looking back, I can see how getting deep into a topic and understanding all the limitations uh, helped me to see what the next important research direction actually could be. And I don't know who needs to hear this in this audience, but for everyone in this community who's struggling or has struggled and is frustrated with their research and robot, don't despair. Don't be afraid of doing something wrong or maybe not getting the results you expected. Nobody knows the right answers in this community, which makes it actually exciting. And uh, you learn a lot from mistakes that you cannot learn from reading papers. And uh, I found that by digging deep and fully understanding the limitations of the methods can open doors to new research problems. So with that, I thank you very much for the attention. I thank my amazing students that I'm allowed to work with. And I thank all my funding agencies. Thank you.
Awesome. Um, I will have my clapping stand in <laughs> for the crashing rounds of applause that you should be getting if we weren't uh, remote. Um, so for people in the audience, um, please ask questions by going into the Q&A uh, and, and you, can, you can type your questions. I don't think we're going to do raising your hands, uh, but just type it in the Q&A. Um, and I see that there were two questions already um, about one topic, so I'll, I'll read those out to you, Jeanette. Um, so um, Erez Karpis was, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to read your name and I'm going to do my best, but I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, um, is, was asking, what if the robot could choose which fixture to use um, in the fixture part of your talk? And also related, Andy Park was asking, do you assume the arm that holds the fixture is always stationary once it's at the target position? Okay, great question. So, so this fixture work is really just a start, right? So we, of course, carefully designed the fixture shape. <clears throat> and we also carefully designed the exploration phase uh, or space, uh, as you always do in RL methods, I think. So um, essentially, um, uh, we assume that this is all given and really the only thing we search for is in a three-dimensional space. Um, and it would be super interesting to explore how we can also um, actually change the geometry of this fixture and maybe optimize that as well, right? So we haven't done this, but I think this is a really cool uh, future direction. And then the question about um, whether the robot is stationary. Yes, we, we do assume right now that the other robot which holds the fixture right now is stationary. Um, I don't think there is a, that's just, um, actually this robot was on the mobile platform, but we didn't move it. So I don't think there's a principal limitation to that. And yes, of course it could be very helpful if the robot could move as well. Um, maybe one point uh, to this, um, something I couldn't show because of limited time. We did check what happens when we take the fixture away again, right? So then of course the inner loop policy doesn't work anymore because it depends on the fixture. But we found that um, using a virtual fixture that basically spans the potential field instead of having the fix uh, physical fixture uh, also still works with that policy. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a robot driving around and moving this physical fixture. You could actually potentially use uh, virtual fixtures instead. So that would be also exciting. Awesome. And then a question from Wen Bo Zhang. Um, he wants to know how you do interpolation for different grippers. So do you do interpolate in the latent space of the point cloud? Yeah, so uh, sorry, this was very fast. <laughs> but um, yeah, so basically we take um, uh, two uh, point clouds of a gripper in a particular configuration. Then we use the learned encoders to project them into the latent space. And there we just draw a straight line, um, straight line between them for interpolation. And we just took uh, some points uh, along that line to basically decode into a point cloud again. So I hope that clarifies that. Cool. Um, and then a really, um, I also have this question, um, but I'll, I'll read it. Uh, Shreyas Kusik, um, what is your opinion on recent developments in tactile feedback, like the gel site? Um, with respect to increasing robustness or enabling more loose planning, um, like because you can feel stuff and then maybe you don't need to plan so much in advance. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we should not plan so much ahead. <laughs> I mean, it's not, we should not spend so much time on, on planning ahead. Um, because things are going to happen and we have to replan anyway. So that's first of all my opinion. And if you want to do that, you need feedback, right? And uh, I showed a lot of work on, on visual feedback today, but I think uh, tactile feedback is so important and I love the gel site sensor. Uh, this is a shout out to Wenjin and Ted Adelson and all the people who worked on this. Uh, Wenjin was actually my postdoc uh, for a year. Now she's at CMU and I hope she is developing more cool versions of this gel site. Um, I haven't actually for grasping used it myself, um, uh, but I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's really great for doing fine man manipulation for ge getting way more information than, uh, for example, from the four stock sensor. So you could also deal with a smaller object, right? I think Alberto Rodriguez's uh, group uh, is also nominated, right, for this interesting cable manipulation in this RSS. So 
uh, yeah, I'm, I think it's super important uh, and it takes, it offloads basically computation if you have that rich uh, feedback. Uh, maybe one wish I have is uh, make it higher frequency, right? 30 hertz for manipulation is very low frequency. So you want that to be faster, but otherwise I, I love it, so. Um. Awesome. Uh, so just related on the topic you just brought up, you know, higher frequency touch sensors. Um, Michael Burke wants to know, um, he's, keen, he's keen to hear what's holding us back more. Are the, is it the hardware limitations in manipulators? Is it lack of sensing like skin sensors? You know, wouldn't it be nice if it were 100 hertz? Or is it the algorithms themselves? You know, what's the, the long pull on the tent? <sighs> Yeah, that question. <laughs> I don't know. Everything. Um, if, you're everything. A, if you're a new PhD student, which one should you go after? Um, okay. So if you're a new PhD student, you should go out. Like all of these three areas have a million open questions, right? All of them. And I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not quite sure which one is holding us back most. Um, and I think if you're a new PhD student, you should just, uh, if you love hardware design, you should go into designing tactile sensors. If you're more an algorithm person and are a little scared of real robots, maybe you want to go more into the algorithmic side and team up with someone who is um, like a great robotics person, right? So I think that maybe should drive what a person picks. Um, and honestly, I, do, I don't have an answer. I think all of them need, um, uh, improvements, although of course there are all these examples of a person teleoperating a robot that is, yeah. has pretty simple hardware, but um, that I think people use this often as an argument for saying, oh, um, uh, it's clear that we, are, we can do a lot of things with our hardware, so we should work more on um, the algorithms, but I think we really uh, need both, and I think having better hardware will um, reduce the computational burden on uh, the algorithms, essentially. That's kind of my view on this. Cool. Um, and then two more related questions that I also, these are, I love that people are asking questions. I have two, this is nice. Um, so Fa uh, Fahad Islam wants, and again, I apologize for saying your name mm -hmm. wrong. I'm sure I am. Um, how do you think we can have reactive closed loop planning for long horizon planning problems? And this is related also Shivani Gupta Sarma was asking, you know, how, what is the definition of good, you know, for the middle of, it, it, it identified the middle of the pencil as a good place. Why is that a good place? Um, and like, you know, my, my version of that question is like, well, if you're trying to hand off the pencil, maybe the, the middle is good, but if you're trying to write with the pencil, maybe you want to grasp it near the tip. And if you're trying to erase, you want to grasp it near the eraser, right? So like, you know, and I think yeah. that makes me think again about longer horizon planning. Why am I grabbing this object? Right. I mean, all of these were already great questions. So, <clears throat> so about the pencil uh, thing uh, of why this is a good grasp. Um, so that was just for pick and place, right? So, but grasping, as you just said, Stephanie, right, is task dependent, of course. So you want to grasp it in a way that uh, actually makes it useful afterwards for whatever you want to do. Um, and we haven't taken this account in this 2009 work, okay? <laughs> but um, actually recently, uh, one of my students, Toki Migimatsu, uh, he uh, worked on task and motion planning, where we actually um, uh, basically took Marc Toussaint's framework uh, of uh, logic geometric programming of combining, you know, a symbolic planner with the trajectory optimizer, and we reformulated the problem to be more object-centric. And uh, so, first of all, this um, reproduce the ability that Mike has shown of like uh, long horizon planning. But what we added now through this object centric approach is that we can suddenly um, uh, change the, or the environment can change uh, while the robot is acting in it. And the plans, uh, the logic plans are actually still staying valid. So no planning was then required. I mean, there are still some limitations, you know, I, I'm happy to talk about this in more detail. Um, but yeah, we, we, need, uh, we need long horizon planning, and I'm super interested in it. Uh, I think the object-centric representation made a lot of sense. Um, that work doesn't have any, any learning in it yet though, right? So um, I think it's very interesting for the low-level sensory motor control to actually include uh, learning-based approaches that maybe take feedback uh, into account. And um, 
I mean, connecting it back to that pencil example. So in that work, um, I think uh, it basically offers the possibility to choose uh, how to grasp an object in order to use it then later um, in a whatever in whatever way you want to use it. Right. Awesome. So I think we'll we'll stop taking questions uh, now. So thanks very much, Jeanette, and I'm going to thank you one more time. My, thank you. My clapping will stand in for again the crashing applause that you would that you really deserve. <laughs> thanks. Thank you.